welcome to New Covenant Ministries live stream. We're so glad you're able to join with us. So go ahead and gather your family and get your Bibles ready. And let's get ready to receive the anointed and the living Word of God. Also, I encourage you, wherever you may be, to go ahead and sing along and to worship with us. Because even though we may not be together, God is still here in the midst of us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're so excited to worship with you. We're just going to open up in prayer, and we're going to get ready to worship together and then hear the wonderful imparted word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful. We're so thankful for all that you've done for us. The work of the cross is finished, Father. We live in victory. We live in abundance. We live in peace. We live in joy, Father, because we live in your presence, God, we enter in today. We worship you. We choose to set aside every weight, every burden, and we just come before you and we lift you up today. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> i 
Everybody, welcome to New Covenant Ministries Church. Whether you're getting us on YouTube, live stream, we're so glad uh, to be in your homes today. Uh, I believe we got a word of encouragement for you to get you through to the next level. And um, so I'm going to get you to turn in your Bibles to um, Hebrews chapter 6. But while we're doing that, we're going to receive tithes and offerings. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness. We've been encouraged by your giving. And uh, in Genesis 8, 22, it says that as long as the earth remains, summer and winter, day and night, cold and heat, seed time and harvest time shall not cease. And our takeaway from that is you can never, you can never go broke by giving. Uh, you can go broke by hoarding, but you can never go broke by giving. Matter of fact, Matthew 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Women, give into your bosom. It's basically repeating Genesis 8, 22. And then, of course, in uh, Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, it's a powerful verse there because God promises to give you power, the power of the seed, to get wealth, to establish his covenant in the earth. And so God wants you to prosper. Third John 2 says that, Beloved, above all else, I pray that you will prosper, that you'll be in health even as your soul prospers. That's your mind, your will, and your emotions. So we've been talking, at least on my time, uh, we've been talking about the just shall live by faith. And uh, I want to continue on that line because it's our lifestyle. It's not something that we do when, when, when trouble comes. It's how we live. Matter of fact, Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. And so it is a fight. And the, and the word fight there is agonizomai. And so it means that there is a struggle involved in it. But the struggle, I, <laughs> I have a fish at home. His name is Hank, and he lives in his own Hank tank. And... I put a mirror up against the tank so that he wouldn't be alone, okay? But now he looks in the mirror and he gets aggressive with the one in the mirror, not realizing, of course, that he's looking at himself. And one day I was sitting there looking at it and I realized, you know what? For all of us, our biggest enemy is the one we look at in the mirror, right? <laughs> you know, it's talking about our flesh, talking about, you know, taking, instead of finding ourselves in the Word of God, we're looking at circumstances. And when you look at circumstances, the circumstances will promote fear every time. The Word of God will promote faith every time because faith comes by hearing 
in here by the Word of God. So I want to look at the life of Abraham for a little bit today. And uh, I want to talk about his covenant and his, he had a covenant, but he had also had a contradiction to the covenant, as you and I do as well. And we'll look into that in a minute. But I just want to pick it up in Hebrews chapter 6, because we can see, you know, God made a covenant with Abraham back in Genesis 15 and verse 6. We'll go there after. But I want to see, I want you to see who the covenant was really made with here in Gen- in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse, uh, well, how, we'll pick it up in verse 13. Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, no. For when God made a promise, rather, to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, He swore by himself. What do you mean by that? Well, the first time I went to court for breaking the law, I was only 10 years old, and uh, that's a whole other story I don't want to get into today. But they brought me the Bible and made me to swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And so what I was doing was I was swearing by somebody greater, God, right? And so here it says, When God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. So he said, I promise to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me, me, because there's nobody greater. And so when God gives you a promise, it's in him, yes, and in him, amen. You can can stand on the promises of God, or you can sit on the premises of a church. Matter of fact, you can be like the guy at the gate, beautiful, in Acts chapter 3. The guy showed up there every day for 40 years. People, people dressed him, made him look pretty, brought him and sat him at the outside of the gate, the beautiful gate, but he never got to go in. And so human effort got him all dressed up and sat him outside the gate, but it took the power of God to get him through the door. And when I read that story one day, I thought that that's the way a lot of people are in the church. We come and we sit and we look and but we never enter in you don't you don't never you, you know it's there and you're and you're all prettied up and you're looking good but you never ever enter in and god wants to take you beyond the veil he wants to take you inside the beautiful gate he has a plan and a purpose for your life but here in hebrews so he, here in hebrews 6 he said he said he couldn't swear by any greater so he swore by himself and this is what he said to abraham And remember, as we're reading this, what it says in Galatians 3, verse 29, if any man, any womb man, a man with a womb, any man be in Christ, he's Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. Okay, so what's the promise? Saying, verse 14, saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. So here's God talking to you through your TV screen or your tablet or however you're watching me today. And he's saying to you, because I'm not giving you my words, I'm giving you his words. He's saying, surely. (laughs) In other words, you can put this in the bank. Surely, blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. God's mind is always on increase. And he's saying, surely, I will bless you. Surely I will multiply you. What do I have to do to receive it? Believe it. See, that's the easy part of the covenant. He, he's the performer of the covenant. We're the believers in the covenant, right? And Abraham, after he had patiently, <laughs> here's the part you don't like. <laughs> after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For here men swear by the greater, which I just did like, like I mentioned when I went to court when I was 10 years old, an oath for a confirmation, and it's the end of all strife. Now, when you receive the covenant of God into your heart, it's the end of all strife. There's no more argument. What if God willing more abundantly to show unto his heirs the promises of the immutability of his counsel confirmed by an oath? Immunability, in other words, never changing. God will never change his mind. I am the Lord and I change not. He swore an oath. 
these two immutable things, which is impossible to God. For Look at this. It says it's impossible for God to lie. We have a strong consolation and a hope and an anchor for our soul. What's he talking about here? He's talking about because God the Father made the covenant with Christ the Son. It's, it's unbreakable. And, the, and how, do I, how do I get in on such a great deal as this? Is it based on my performance? No, it's based on my, on my belief system. If I believe this, it's immutable. And it's an anchor for my soul. It's sure and steadfast and enters within the veil. The next verse says, Wherein is the forerunner for us entered in Jesus, made the high priest after the order of Melchizedek or Melchizedek. Melchizedek is king and Zedek is righteousness. The king of righteousness has made a way for you. And when it talks about him being a forerunner, I've, I've explained this to our church before, but in case you've just tuned in, a forerunner, when they're coming into a strange bay or a, a strange harbor back in the day in a wooden ship, they needed to know where the rocks were. They didn't have sonar. They would have a man called the forerunner that would dive off the bow of the ship and swim ashore, pulling a little rope, which was attached to a much bigger rope on the ship. And when he got a safe passage to shore, he would tie it to a tree or a big rock, and then he would pull the bigger rope. And then all the ship had to do to find that safe passage was follow the rope. And so what he's saying to you is, I've already entered in within the veil. He's saying, Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly onto the throne room of grace to obtain mercy, to find grace, to help you in your time of need. So this is a powerful truth here, that he's already made a way where there was no way. You have a way now. You have a way into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So anyway, um, with that in mind, let's go back to Genesis chapter 15. Now, God is in the process here in Genesis chapter 15 of destroying what Abraham used to believe. I mean, he came out of Ur of the Chaldees and they worshiped the sun god and the moon god and all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, God was educating him. And we read in Genesis 13 too that Abraham was very rich with silver and gold and cattle and camels and all that. And so, again, Genesis or Galatians 3.29, if any man be in Christ, he's Abe's seed. God is not concerned about how much money you have as long as money doesn't have you. Matter of fact, again, Deuteronomy 8.18, the purpose was to establish his covenant in the earth, right? So anyway, here in chapter 15, he shows up... <laughs> <laughs> he shows up and he says, After these things, the word of the Lord appeared unto Abram in a vision and said, Fear not, Abraham, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And what he was saying to him was, I am your soldier, your protector, your warrior, and I'm your rapidly increasing supply of finances. Read it in the Hebrew. He's talking about, I will increase you more and more, you and your children, like he said in Psalm 115. God is always on increase. And he's saying, Abraham, I want to enter into a covenant with you. Uh, you be my farmer. You be my seed planter. And I'll be your soldier, your protector. I'll be you. I'll be your Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of armies. And I'll, uh, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll pay you well. <laughs> I'll pay you well. So, because back in that day, uh, like you can see it in the life of King David, he protected the flocks of, uh, oh, I forget the guy's name. Ab Ab Was it Abigail's wife? Uh, Abigail's wife, Abigail's husband. Nab I want to say Naboth, but he had the vineyard. I forget the guy's name. Anyway, he, David protected this man's flocks and, and herds. And then one day David needed something and the man refused him. But again, David had a covenant with the guy in that he was, as long as he was there, no one stole his sheep, no one touched his oxen. David was, it was a covenant truth there. Oh, what was the guy's name? Anyway, it doesn't matter. 
Doesn't matter, I'm here talking to myself in the room, and so it's a little more difficult than it is when you're here as an audience and pulling these things up and out of me. But anyway, my point is, God is approaching Abe and saying, I want to enter into a, a fresh new covenant with you, buddy. I, I, want to, I want to take care of you. And of course, Abe's response is, what's in it for me? And, and it wasn't... It, it, it was it, the, the response was real because Abraham understood that covenant was genera- went from one generation to another, and really what he's saying is, God, if I enter into a covenant with you, I have no seed. All I have is e- Eliasar e- here uh, that grew up in my own house, but I don't have a child of my own. Let's read. It. See, I, look, Lord, look, I, I go childless. Verse three. Verse 2, rather, I'm going childless, and Eliezer of Damascus is my only seed. And Abraham said, and Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, and one born in my house is my heir. But verse 4, Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir. I'm going to bring one forth out of your own bowels that shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad. And said, look toward the heaven and look at the stars and see if you can number them. So shall your seed be. And so now here's a man, here's a man that's well on in years. And God is now promising him a son. And so he's entering into a covenant. But the contradiction is he's old. And to to complicate this contradiction is his wife couldn't have a baby when she was young. And now she's old. And so but and here's God promising promising him a seed out of his own loins. And and verse six is so powerful because it's a, it says that Abraham believed God. And so his he recognized that a covenant was greater than the contradiction. What was the contradiction? I'm old. I'm too old to have a baby. My wife has never been able to have a baby. And so it takes and, and so <laughs> well, how can we clear this up a little better? He believed the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And he said unto him, Lord, you brought me out of Ur the Chaldees and gave me this land to inherit. And he said, Lord, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And, and, then, and then, of course, they go through the covenant uh, routine. They, they kill the animal, offer the sacrifice and all of that. And then... It, by, by the time you get to the end of chapter 15, we read it in Hebrews chapter 6. It says that Abraham, a deep sleep came upon Abraham. You see, Abe couldn't, you and I couldn't keep the covenant. And so Abe had to be knocked out, put under anesthetic, just like Adam back in Genesis chapter 2. It, it, he was knocked out, and then it says, well, maybe we could just read it. I wasn't planning on any of this, okay. (laughs) Anyway, the covenant promises are listed all the way up through to verse 15, 16. Verse 17, it came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark. A smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the covenant emblems. Now, you know, our, our God is a consuming fire and the word of God is a lamp unto my feet. So I can see God the Father and I can see Christ the Son there walking, walking the way of blood and entering into a covenant. With, and, and again, Abraham, you and I, we get into this covenant not because we could keep it all, but because of Genesis fifteen six, Abram Abram believed God, and that's why got him into the covenant. It wasn't based on his performance. God had to knock him out to 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 make the covenant real between by these two immutable things in which it's impossible to lie, for God to lie. We have a strong ho- consolation and hope and anchor for the soul because God the Father made the covenant with Christ the Son. It cannot be broken. Amen? All right, amen. And we could get into, well, let's get in, let's read Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. Well, no, let's read Genesis uh, 16 in the last verse first. It says, Abraham was four, four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to him. So here he is, 86 years old, 
He had been believing God for his son, but him and his wife got together and thought that they would help the situation by, by him going to sleep and having sex with Hagar, and that produced Ishmael, and the, the problems from that are still going on in the Middle East today. Uh, but, but what you see here is now human effort, just like Moses, when God told Moses he was going to be the deliverer of the Hebrew people to Israel, but the first thing he did was went out and killed an Egyptian. It cost 40 years to get that thing fixed up. And here's Abram doing the same thing. They thought that they could help God along, that they had a better idea than, than God. And so he's 86 years old in the last verse of chapter 16 of the book of Genesis. And when you read Genesis 17, verse 1, 13 years have gone by. 13 years have gone by in between two verses. And what it tells me is he tried it his own way and God was silent for 13 years. Wow. But God didn't abandon him. Why? Because he has a covenant. We have a covenant and a covenant keeping God. And Abraham was 90 years old and nine, 99, right? 99 years old. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be perfect. What he was really saying to him was, I, I need to get you moving. I need to wake you up. <laughs> he said, I, and, and it's time for you to become complete. It's time for you to, to start advancing. Really, this is what he's saying to him is, okay, Abe, you've been stuck. You've been stuck for 13 years. It's time to, be, to, to start advancing and become complete or become mature. And I will make my covenant between you and your seed, and I will multiply them exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face saying, God. And God talked with him saying, as for me, and this is, this is God's approach to you also, as for me, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name be any more called Abram, but Abraham. Abraham means the father of a multitude. And it's interesting, too, because when he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, a year later, he was the father of, of Isaac. And what, what, what's it mean to change his name from Abram to Abraham? Again, Abraham means the father of a multitude. And my Bible says, your Bible says in Romans 4, 17, that when, you, when, you, when you're like God, when you become like God, you call the things that be not as though they were. He was childless other than Ishmael, an illegitimate son. He was childless. He's still looking at Eliezer to be his heir. And God is saying, start calling yourself the father of a multitude. Call those things that be not as though they were. So then whenever he would go anywhere, he'd have to identify himself. Hi, I'm the father of a multitude. Imagine how stupid he looked. He didn't even have any kids. But he was calling those things that be not as though they were. And when he began to do that, and he got the revelation of that, it produced Isaac in his life. With that in mind, let's go to um, let's go to Romans chapter four. Yeah, praise the Lord, Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but sitting home having church, uh, I've been doing it. I've been watching Nancy. Nancy gets into it at home just like she does here. She's bouncing around in front of the TV, praising God and everything, and I'm sitting there and um, I'm not really entering in, you know, struggling to enter in. And, um, and, and, and so I, I'm picturing you at home right now. There's so many distractions at home. I cannot wait for us to get together. I believe church will never be the same again, ever, ever in Jesus' name. But anyway, let's go to Romans 4, like I said. We'll pick it up in uh, verse 17. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations before him whom you believed, even God, who quickens. Look, he, now he's telling them what happened. He quickened Abram's dead body. 
He quickens the dead, sexual deadness in him and Sarah. Sarah's plumbing was long gone. He quickened the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were. Look at verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according as it is written, which was spoken, so shall your seed be. Verse uh, 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead. And, and here's, here's um, the, po the point of the whole message is really here. He has a covenant. His contradiction is his own body is old and won't work anymore. And so he, but he doesn't address the contradiction. He addresses his covenant. He doesn't try to reconcile his, his covenant with his contradiction. He accepts the covenant. And listen to me, this is the key to everything you're going to deal with in God. Like maybe you're at home right now and you're dealing with sickness in your body. My Bible says that you're to consider not your own body. What are you to consider? That by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed and made whole. How long will you have to do that? Well, Abram did it for a year and Isaac was produced. But the thing is, he didn't even consider, didn't even think about his own body. Now you think about how you might pamper yours, run to the medicine cabinet and get this drug and that drug and all those other kind of things. You, but you don't consider. What does, what it, you can also relate this in the area of finances. You know, my Bible says, and again, we talked about it at the start of this, give and it shall be given unto you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, run over. Maybe you can't see it right now, but, you're, but you don't consider that. What you consider is your covenant. You don't consider the contradiction to the covenant. You accept the covenant as truth. The other things are just facts that are subject to change. That's what he talked about in Corinthians 4 and verse 18. The things that we look at are temporal, subject to change. The things that we can't see are eternal. So we keep on, keep on like Abe did in faith, man. <laughs> come on, come on. He didn't even look at his own body. Didn't even consider his own body. We're talking about what faith really looks like. <laughs> he considered not his own body now dead, being a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. Didn't even look at it, people, because he believed God. And it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Do, are we really believers or make believers? I, I'm reading a book right now by Lillian B. Yeomans. And, it, you know, it was written back in the early 1900s. But she goes through some of the church history. And as late as 300, 350 A.D., the church was still healing the sick and raising the dead. And it was routine. Like James said, is there any sick among you? Let us call the elders of the church and the prayer of faith will raise the, heal the sick. They believe that. Matter of fact, I read a letter that one guy was, that one of the leaders of the church in 300 AD said this about another group of people. He said they're hypocrites. He said they can't even raise the dead, nor do they believe it's possible. So the early, the first three or 400 years of the church, it, we, they didn't struggle with what we have to deal with. A national, a corporate unbelief, a church that, that, that's hoping something will happen, but not really expecting it to be so. Well, Abe got way beyond that. Now, it took him 30 years to get there, so don't be hard on yourself. But on the other hand, stir, your, stir yourself up a little bit today. Hmm. Look at this. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong. And it's the word genomai. It means became. He, he didn't start out strong. He became strong. Hallelujah. <laughs> he became strong. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but became strong, giving glory to God. We're about to see global glory. I, I know we had a global pandemic. Let me declare this to you by the Spirit of Almighty God. We will have a global glory. Amen. He became fully persuaded that what God had promised, and I've heard this my whole church life, well, Lord, if you be willing. He is willing. Read Matthew chapter 8 when the leper came to him. He said, Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. 
and, and immediately Jesus did it. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. It's God's will for you to be healed. It's God's will for you to be prosperous. It's God's will for you to come. He came that you might have a, a, a life, an abundant life. And that he even said more abundantly, more abundantly. He's expecting you and I to be overcomers. So it says here, he became fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was also powerful to perform. And here's the thing. You're not the performer of it. Huh? You're the believer of it. You don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to perform the healing in your body. You don't have to perform the prosperity in your life. What you and I need to do is be, make sure we're believing and not make believing, that we're, that we're real and that we're not just pretending. Verse 23, now this was not written for us, for him alone, but look at verse 24, but for us also of whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered, look at this verse 25, who was delivered for our, offense, for our offenses and raised again for our what? Our justification. Praise God. Well, let's have communion. Well, we'll give you a, a few seconds there to get your emblems. Again, I, I want to remind you that every time we do these things, we celebrate the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and realize that he was the ultimate sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10, read Hebrews chapter 10 sometimes. It talks about once and for all time. Once to cover your sin, once to cover your healing, once to cover your prosperity, once and for all, he took it all. He didn't come to serve his own purpose. He came to, to rescue you and to rescue me. And so the Bible says in, in Corinthians chapter 11 that the same hour that Jesus was betrayed. And again, I'd like to point out that be, the last song that they sang after they did their Passover emblems was they sang Psalm 118. In verse 24, it says, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I'll be glad in it. I won't be miserable and sad in it. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. And he was on his way to Calvary. But he had he Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 going on off in his spirit. The joy that was set before me, I'll endure the cross and despise the shame. He was looking right into your living room. He was looking right into your heart. He came to rescue you, and it gave him great joy to know that he was going to fulfill that purpose. So the same night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, the matzah. You can see it if you have matzah. You can see the pierce marks, you can see the bruises, and he was broken, his body was broken for you. He said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, remember the ultimate sacrifice. At the same time, he reached for the redemptive cup. He's your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, remember the price that I paid to be everything you'll ever need. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. We hope this message has encouraged you in your relationship with the Lord. For more information and ministry resources, we invite you to visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca. We look forward to you joining us next time as we continue to live victoriously.